Hello. It's Dave Seeley again. Thanks, Thanks for it. Um, if anybody knows macroinvertebrates in this part of the country, it's horrible. And I've learned a lot from him over the years. Yeah. And somebody else, somebody else, actually, the talk I made to today was, was developed in large part from what uh, Ford Walton and Bob Rugger had done years and years and years ago. And so these methods have been adapted from their methods um, going back over 20 years, 25 years. Um, so I want to talk about how we can use macroinvertebrates to, to assess aquatic habitats, canals, streams, and wetlands in southwest Florida. And I've developed, based on methods that were handed to me, developed what I think is a rapid field assessment, and then a statistical tool that we can detect change through time. We can also look at impacted areas and, and track restoration success or failure. And we can also do uh, aquatic habitat assessments and diagnoses. Um, why use bugs? Why use macroinvertebrates? Well, they are incredibly important linkages in the food chains in South Florida, and the Everglades in particular. Uh, for example, uh, I mentioned earlier, alligators depend on apple snails. They also depend on crayfish for a big part of their food uh, when they're very young. Uh, what what sharks? Uh, 
few years, uh, starting down to the south of Picayune Strand. How many of you know about Picayune Strand? 55,000 acre restoration project, early action uh, accelerate project. Um, Flint Pan Strand, that's where part of the water management district study was done, and the Star Bay Watershed. This was a study we did for the MEP back in 2004, 10 years ago. My goodness. Um, Starting to the south, there was a refugia study done by the Conservancy of Southwest Florida, and I was fortunate to be a part of that team. And we looked at, it was a three-year study, looking at different deep water refugia, aquatic refugia, and how those water resources or refugia might support the recovery of threatened and endangered species. This was a half million dollar study, very intensive, it included wading bird surveys, wildlife surveys, fish and invertebrate surveys, amphibian, a whole gamut. And what we looked at was these five, point out these five deep water refugia. Artificial canals, artificial water, uh, water bodies like burrow pits, willow ponds in a drained landscape of Picayune. The lower right hand we had tram ditches and in the center we had pond apple pop ash ponds in the middle of Fatty Hatchy Strands, so the best aquatic habitat left. Looking just at the bugs, um, I had left the Conservancy, was at FGCU by then, and I wanted to do, being a bug nerd, and I wanted to do some supplemental data analysis of what we had found. And again, we had 20 wetlands that we sampled, 24 times over three years, 21,000 organisms were identified to the lowest tax level, six classes, 21 orders, 54 families, and 110 taxonomic units that were statistically valid for analysis. When I say statistically valid, we call these OTUs. A lot of these critters have various life stages or various mid stars. It's impossible to take it to species level without breaking the bank or raising them to adulthood. So we have to cut off that taxon at some point. For some at species level, they're easy to identify. Some it's uh, upper the genus or even family level. So I just want to make that point. We have these operational taxonomic units, and we use multivariate analysis. In this case, primer version six had just come on the scene. Talk about this real briefly. Uh, of course, Primer does many very diversity methods, Shannon diversity, and Margaret richness, uh, Simpson's index, and species abundance, things like that. But we also want to look at multivariate tools, which look at the whole community together. Rather than reducing the whole community and all that life history information down into a single number, it looks at the whole community and compares one community to another. The great Curtis similarity is the tool that we use. And we use a cluster analysis, it's called hierarchical agglomerative clustering. Um, we use multidimensional scaling. And there's a new significance test that Primer came up with, Larkin already came up with this, and it's called the Simcroft test. The Simcroft test is simply a random permutation test that looks for significance in the cluster analysis. Wonderful tool. Uh, there's also a Simperg test. The Simperg test is a similarity percentage test, and it ranks the importance of each individual species separating groups or making groups more similar to each other. You'll see how that works in a minute. There's also a global uh, significance test, which is the Anison test. And this way we can look at our artificial ponds, like willow ponds, as a group. And we can lump these groups together and provide the same priority categories and compare them to see if they're significant. What did we find? In this study, I have to go through this very quickly. We have three major groups. Remember, this is three years of study. We have three major groups going from left to right. We have the pop ash ponds and tram ditch ponds grouping together. Whereas you were there, we have a separation of these three groups. In the middle, we have the willow ponds, and on the right hand side, we have the artificial ponds. These are borrow pits and canals. Now, what makes them similar to each other? Well, artificial ponds and canals are excavated out of limestone, very hard water. They're open, they get full sunlight all day long, they're full of hydrilla and other aquatic plants. So they have a very unique kind of water chemistry, not necessarily bad water quality, but different from natural systems, like the artificial, uh, like the willow ponds and the ash ponds. How does this look in ordination space? Very nice. Beautiful picture. I was able to even draw a line through here. Pacatchee Strand, these are the natural ash ponds of Pacatchee Strand, this is the willow communities. And remember the distance that you see there it indicates how similar or dissimilar they are. The closer they are, the more similar, the farther away they are, the more dissimilar. And what you see on the lower left, these are the canals and artificial ponds. And they group very nicely together. Um, 
over on the right hand side, these are the willow ponds. The willow ponds used to be cypress stones or deep potash ponds that were drained and logged and the fire has burned through them and sent them back in succession several hundred years, if not thousands of years. So these three different water refuge in terms of bugs in the southwest were. Another study that was done, this is the Picking and Strand Restoration Project. Again, this was started uh, in partnership with the Conservancy of Southwest Florida, working closely with them. Uh, we did the sampling protocol. Uh, the Water Management District asked me to select some reference sites. So this, we had 32 impacted sites, and we selected 11 reference sites in the Panther Refuge and in uh, the Hatchy Strand, even down into 10,000 islands. I'm going to go move quickly here, but what I wanted to point out, in this case, what we're looking for, the impacts of the canals on the landscape in Picayune Strand. The impacts of the canals, it's drawn the water table down several feet, closer to the canal, and more of the water table has been drawn down. When it does get wet, there's no sheet flow connection, and the water doesn't stay on the landscape very long. So the hydro period's been shorter, sheet flow connection's been interrupted, and you know, it's just basically the water's not there for very long. So, so in this case, we're looking for bugs that are hydroperiod indicators. This is the green darner, Annex junius. And from my experience, and the board may correct me, but from my experience, this invertebrate, this dragonfly, and dragonflies have been around for over 300 million years. So they've, they've speciated and diversified, but this is one that requires six to nine months hydroperiod in South Florida, maybe even longer in some cases, up north, up where I'm from, up in the Midwest. These things take two years to complete their life cycle. So if we have these completing their life cycle, what you see here is the exuvia. To reach this stage of development, we know that that hydro period is close to nine months. Really important for diagnosis and restoration success when we're trying to restore hydro periods. The, the, the method that we developed uh, was based on a, a timed method, one hour, dip netting, hand picking substrates, we're flipping logs over, picking stuff off of them. We find a beer bottle, we can pick it up, look at, we'll find limpets and snails and things on that. So it's a, it's a very intensive, but it's time limited. So we're digging in, field sorting in a pan in the box, we're putting them into a jar of ethanol, taking it back to confirm identification in the lab. Um, again, I can skip through this whole fashion, like 32 impacted sites, 11 reference sites. Turns out 32 of those impacted sites, 11 of them, were dry in the entire two years. We were unable to sample, and that's how drained they were. And they still looked like cypress, but they were drained. Um, we looked at cypress, cypress granite, wet prairie, hydric pine, basic pine, and marshes. Um, we sampled three times a year for two years. We identified, I identified, 7,123 individual macroinvertebrates in this study, six classes, 20 orders, and 57 families. In this case, I was able to get up to 182 operational taxi units. This is what it looks like. I'm going to go through these quickly. The blue are the reference sites, and they group very tightly together. The green are the impacted sites, and you notice the scatter. This is what I wanted to get to. Look at all the seas here. The seas, these are all deep cypress. Look at the scatter. They're very dissimilar to each other. This is a reflection of the lack of sheet flow. Organisms are not able to slosh back and forth. But if you look at the blue dots, those are the reference sites. Even though the habitat is very different, we have hydric pine, we have graminoid, we have cypress. Because of the sheet flow, we basically have a very, very similar, if not the same community. Um, then the invertebrate calibration was also done for the Asteroid Watershed coming back up in the peat area. Um, this is something that we started at the Conservancy as well with, uh, with Steve Wartone who had just jumped ship to go to SCCF. We looked at 25 sites. And what we were trying to do in the Asteroid Watershed was to biologically calibrate the Asteroid Watershed Assessment, which was based entirely on graph sample water quality. Um, we used benthic macroinvertebrates collected by Petit Monar, and that had some problems with it. Um, we identified 113 taxi units in this study. And they were identified by FDDP biologists in Tallahassee, so we tried to provide the best quality taxonomy we could. Um, we were looking again for water quality indicators in the system, and very quickly, this is to give you an idea of all water quality sampling sites in the watershed. What we found was very confusing. This is the ordination. We did see some group meetings. The six mile sites group right here, uh, 10 mile canal sites were kind of scattered around, had this. Big 
cluster here. Um, a lot of the other sites were scaled, we couldn't really make much sense of it. Um, well, we did find that the relationship between the water quality assumptions and the biota was, was not clear. Uh, it was not well correlated. The petite water samples didn't work well because you're sampling the sand in the middle of the creek, you should be sampling the edges where the critters are. Pasture then we did net sampling was recommended, and this was also recommended by Russ Rybord and DDP that we look at dip net sampling, and uh, snags and shoreline cover were really important. Now the main point, hopefully I'll have time to cover this in detail, but Babcock Ranch is where we've been working lately since 2006. This is Babcock Ranch, located in Charlotte, Lake County. Uh, 91,000 acres, 17,000 plus is owned by uh, Kitson Partners, and that's 74,000 is owned by the state. And what we want to do is a baseline of aquatic fauna. We looked from 2006 to 2013. This is a very robust baseline. We looked at marshes, domes, strands, canals, and streams. What did we find? Um, I need to point out something here. This is the Curry Canal system. This Curry Canal drains Curry Lake, which is on state land, and it ties into Trout Creek. Remember that. Looking at wetlands, um, real quickly, we should see the reference support of what we saw in Picayune. The reference sites, even though they're different, marsh and site was grouped together. And we have two marshes, which are being mitigated, and hopefully these will restore. They group off by themselves. Ordination space is what it looks like a lot scattered with the marsh sites. They're very dissimilar to each other, even though the habitat's the same. Reference sites group closer together. Streams and canals. This is what we found a very similar pattern. We have the streams in blue on the right. We have Curry Canal at the county line on the left. Ordination and MDS, this is the same type of thing we're seeing. Um, what, what makes the canals different? This is the bottom line. We're looking for indicators. And I have three minutes to cover this, so bear with me. When I put these pictures in, at the top, the most important species for separating canals and streams in 2012 was this basic exotic snail, Melanoides tubercula. Here it is, down right here. It's not found in the streams, but quite abundant in the canals. Going down the list, it's another exotic. Corbicula is an exotic clam. It's an Asian clam. It was on the streams, but much more abundant in the canals. Everything up in blue there, I consider to be an indicator, a good indicator of freshwater ecosystems and streams anyway. Um, and you'll notice if you go down the list there, some of them are present only in streams and not in canals. And uh, going down the list, we have also. A couple of mayflies. These mayflies here, Sandina, Cipolia, only found or much more abundant in the streams and not found in the canals. Now, this is the top ranking. These, these ones here are very, uh, the top ranking ones. And there's one here that's actually an exotic, but it's a good indicator. This is an exotic fingernail clam. It was found in the streets, but not in the canals. So, the habitat of native fingernails. Exotic fingernails is good in streams, but not in canals. Looking at more rare species, I've had this debate with some faculty members at GCU that rare species are important. We found that in Frankenhatchee, and then we found it in Babcock Ranch. Now I'll look at these top ones here. These are heteropterids, not found in streams. Remember, the streams, they have canopies closed, the canals have these open canopies in sunlight, they look a little more like a weapon. So, looking at this list here, getting down, uh, here's, here's a native fingernail clam. Again, found in the streams, not in, in the canals. This one here is my favorite. What do you see here? Where are else can do this? Dots and pilot. This is four inches long. You ever come across one of those? They're scary. Here's <laughs> an adult female. Here's an adult male. I mean, these are aggressive creatures. They actually are good indicators. And we're probably at the very southern limit of their range, by the way. I think Blue Sahachi may be about to cut off. Uh, I think they, they've been recorded from the Orange River. But some of these bugs are not only interesting and scary, but they are really good indicators for separating streams from canals. Now, the implications of this can be tremendous because I know there's a big canal study going on. Um, 
In conclusion, I gotta wrap this up. Microbirds, bugs, are valuable for assessing the weapons and animals and streams in Southwest Florida. Hydro period indicators. We've identified water quality indicators. We've identified habitat indicators. They're valid for community comparisons and detecting change over time. And Mike Duber hammered this home to me many times. He said, Dave, it doesn't have to be rocket science, but if we can reliably detect change through time, if we can look at trends, these scattering of disturbed sites are going to move our nation space toward that reference condition. Uh, finally, field sorting and lab ID is a cost effective yet quantifiable and accurate way to assess aquatic ecosystems. And the added value is you've got a jar of bugs that can go to a museum and persist in perpetuity as altruists. So you can always have somebody come back and cross check your work. Sorry if I go on over and I get excited about bugs. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Any questions? When you talked about field sorting, was that what is what is a sorting part of sorting? Uh, if you want any of these reports that I've referenced, 